we're still having, I think everyone can hear now. Welcome, welcome. I'm Karen LeGrew. I grew up in Laguna Beach. I'm um, class of 1983, and I'm the current president of the Laguna Beach Historical Society. And, um, and uh, we are um, uh, all volunteer, registered nonprofit organization. So we have members here and non members here, but we have some board members and uh, Again, there's no paid employees, it's all volunteer. And our location is down between uh, Whole Foods and Wells Fargo, the Murphy Smith Bungalow. If you haven't been in, it's open Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 1 to 4. So um, we're here t tonight to present stories of Laguna Beach history. And we're fortunate to have a wonderful speaker tonight and a huge crowd for the speaker. So that's great. Um, we're glad you could make it tonight and know you'll enjoy hearing about our speaker, Dick Metz's boyhood adventures in Laguna Beach. In a time when Laguna Beach was much different than it is today, Dick Metz is well known for his accomplishments as an adult, but tonight I'm looking forward to hearing how he spent his earliest days in the sand and the hills and the town of Laguna Beach. I'd like to read a little bit about Dick um, to you. He was born in 1929. His parents, Carla, Carl and Edna May, made their way to Laguna Beach, where he was born. Carl Metz owned two restaurants that were located at Main Beach before it was a park, the Laguna Diner and the Broiler. And some of these items are on display at the back of the room. Carl Metz, um, his mother taught fifth and sixth grades in the local school on Park Avenue. One of our board members here who arranged uh, Dick's speech has a photo of his, with his mother in her grade school class in the back also, Jane Petty. Dick literally grew up on the sand while nearby his parents watched from the window of their restaurant. At seven years old, in 1936, he served San Onofre with Peanuts Larson and Hefsa McClellan. Besides, <laughs> besides the water, Dick enjoyed his time as a Boy Scout, running track, he was, he was and still is a natural born athlete. He currently divides his time between Idaho, where he skis, and Laguna Beach. Dick Metz is a pioneer in the travel surf and surf shop industry. He started, owned, and operated Hobies in Laguna Beach and had 22 stores at one time, and also was the owner of Spigot Liquor in Laguna. He is the founder of the Surfing Heritage Museum in, in excuse me. He is the founder of the Surfing Heritage Museum in San Clemente. And uh, obviously, he gives lots of his time and free time to us, and we're so happy he got to um, be, he's here tonight to donate his time to speak about his stories in Laguna Beach for the Historical Society. Okay, thank you, and welcome, Dick Metz. <laughs> I'm amazed how many people are here, and there's several here in the audience that should be up here with me. I wanted to introduce them. Donnie Crevy and Rick Balls are back there. And that's the back row. And you, should, you should know, if you're interested in Laguna history, Rick just wrote a book called The Laguna Kid, and the things that he did were very similar. Mine were a little bit further to the... I'm not sure the right or the left, but uh, anyway, you want to look at his book called The Laguna Kid. It's all about growing up here in Laguna, which I did, and it was great to have him with the book. So, uh, thank you, Joe Baker's back there. I see him. A lot of old friends have probably heckled me, so disregard them. <laughs> well, I, I think to start off, I ought to tell you how I arrived here. Um, my mom and dad both grew up in Pomona. My mom and dad both went to Chafee College. In those days, two years of college, you could be a teacher. So my mom became a teacher, got her first job, was at Big Bear, by the way, and she taught the entire school from first grade to eighth grade. And when you were in the ninth grade, you had to go down to San Bernardino and go to high school and stay with some friends or relatives. So my dad got a job running the Safeway store in Big Bear, and <clears throat> It was during the Depression, and things were tough. Businesses were going out of business, and my dad always wanted his own business, so he'd tell the salesman that would come up to the Safeway, uh, you know, look for a business that I can take over, because a lot of them were going broke in those days. So um, one day, I guess so the story goes that my dad told me, a meat salesman came up, and he said, Carl, I just heard my company that I work for in L.A. Um, took over a, a restaurant in Laguna Beach, and it was called the Laguna Diner, 
They owed $167 and went through bankruptcy, and the meat company took it over, and if you go down and pay the meat bill, you can have the restaurant. <laughs> so, in those days, like I say, it was a depression, things were tough, and people didn't have any money, so my dad got an old Model A, drove to L.A., paid $167, and ended up with a Laguna Diner. So, he and my mom moved to Laguna, and I was born here, and my mom became a teacher here. She was mentioned in Park Avenue, and um, my dad ran the Laguna Diner. There's some pictures back there of the old dining car, and it was on the grass right in front of what the lifeguard tower is now, but all that lawn from the Hotel Laguna to the uh, lifeguard headquarters used to be buildings. There was a dance hall, my dad's restaurant, other businesses, and actually houses right on the boardwalk that several people lived on. So uh, <clears throat> the dining car was right in front of the lifeguard tower, and my dad put me out there in a little playpen, and he was cooking the hamburgers and couldn't look out the window and see that I was still moving. But <clears throat> as time got bigger, I was out of the playpen and just running around on the, on the beach. So uh, about that time, my uncle, uh, was younger my dad, he got out of school and came down to wash dishes. And I just want to tell you how Laguna was. Uh, obviously, things have changed, every place changes. But Laguna was really unique. It had a lot of interesting, artsy, craftsy, uh, creative kind of people that lived here. And um, so my uncle came down, and he was kind of not artsy, craftsy, but he was crafty. Uh, <laughs> so, and in those days, he was washing dishes for my dad and not making any money, obviously. So you could <clears throat> send away to Chicago and get little punch boards. They would have a a metal thing you'd stick to and push out a, a little note on the back of the punch board and it'd say you won 50 cents or a dollar or something. So right away he got into the gambling business and he got some other machines and finally got slot machines that he put in my dad's restaurant and put two of them in the drugstore in the corner of Forest and Coast Highway and it caused such a traffic jam at noon people wanted to play the slot machines that the city council had to outlaw coin-operated machines in Laguna Beach. So that, that was the first kind of upbringing that I got in Laguna about you getting in business and then the city's going to rain on you if it, uh, you're not doing the right thing. So about 1935, and actually I pinned it up on the wall back there, it was in the South Coast News, which I used to deliver papers for, uh, my dad uh, owned the business, but he didn't own the property. And um, the company that owned the property at that time in Los Angeles decided to move the dining car. They towed it down the coast highway and put it right across the street from the coast inn. So my dad ran it down there, but they were building him a new restaurant right on the same location on the lawn, right in front of the lifeguard tower. And that was a big building with, I don't know how many square feet, but it must have been you know, 15,000 or more than that because there was a dancing in the back, a bar, and a restaurant. And by then I was, you know, five, six, seven years old and running around. And some of you that have been here a long time will remember Peanuts Larson and Hez McClellan. And they were kind of older brothers to me. And <clears throat> they were not making a living and they were diving for abalone and lobster and would bring those to my dad and sell them. And, um, my dad finally said one day, well, you guys are always hungry. I'll give you a hamburger and a beer if you look after my kid. So they, they didn't give a rat's ass about me, but they wanted a hamburger and a beer at the end of the day. It was, you know, it was still a depression. They didn't have a place to stay or sleep on the beach and in their car. And they were going surfing. Peanuts made a board right in front of the restaurant. And I still have it in the museum. By the way, I invite you all to come to Surfing Heritage in San Clemente. I'll be glad to give you a tour of the world's biggest surf museum. Um, so that would be fun if you get the urge to come down there. So um, anyway, Peanuts and Hez took me, you know, just whatever they were doing. If they were going out in the dory fishing or diving, they put me in the boat. If they were going to San Onofre go surfing, they put me in the rumble seat of this old Model A they had along with the surfboard that I have in the museum and take me down there because 
I was a little kid, they could lift me up in tandem and surf with me. So I started surfing at San Onofre and Doheny with them on that board when I was six, seven years old. So that was the beginning of my uh, surfing career, uh, which I've been doing all my life. So that's about all I ever did. Um, but it was a lot of fun, and they were great guys to take care of me. But they taught me a lot, too. And Laguna had so many characters then, and being that age, uh, and in the restaurant every day, my mom would teach school, and after school she'd come down and, and take cash at the register at night. Uh, I'd have dinner there, and then my mom would walk me home. We lived, uh, well, we lived a couple places, but on uh, Glen Erie, and then when we moved to our permanent home was on El Camino del Mar, right down from the school. So it was a couple blocks walk to home, but I was at the restaurant morning, noon, and night, uh, we ate three meals a day there, and my mom and dad both worked there. So I got a first-hand view of these unique people that came into the bar. Uh, and <clears throat> so right away, uh, about that same time, 1935-36, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby started the uh, Del Mar racetrack. So the movie guys, and you know, they made more money than everybody else, but they weren't so aloof as they are now. So they would drive after they'd close the lot at MGM or Warner Brothers, wherever they were, on Friday afternoon, they'd drive to Laguna, uh, spend the night in Laguna, have dinner, cocktails. Saturday morning, they'd go to Del Mar, go to the races Saturday, Saturday night, and Sunday go to the races. And Sunday afternoon, after the last race, they'd drive back to Laguna, spend Sunday night here, and then Monday morning, go back to their lots. So in those days, you know, I didn't even know what movie stars were, but one day Shirley Temple came down, and she was exactly the same age I was. So she was down every weekend with her parents, and her folks and my folks would have dinner together. And Shirley and I would make sand castles out on the beach and play in the sand. And Betty Davis was here, Victor Mature, um, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, obviously. And they'd all be drinking in my dad's bar. And so I'm getting uh, there after dinner, would kind of hang out and watch all these weird folks and the things that they were doing. So I got an early view of, of what was going on in those days. And there was Steinbeck lived here before he went to, and did the book Cannery Row. So there was a lot of artsy, craftsy people. And along with the movie stars, some of the um, guys that built the sets in Hollywood were artsy guys. And they'd come down, they didn't want to go to the racetrack. So they would spend the whole weekend here. And I don't know the guy's name that was working in Hollywood, but I remember his dog's name. He had a great, ugly English bulldog named Jake's. And he would come over, he would rent a room. In those days, Carpenters, that some of you might remember, was next to the theater on the Coast Highway. And above that, there were rooms for rent. So he'd always stay at Carpenters, walk across the street to my dad's bar, carrying jigs. He always would bring a pie pan, and he'd order a case of Acme beer. Acme was kind of the Budweiser of those days. It was a hot beer. And he'd put a case on the bar, and he'd have a bottle of beer, and he'd pour a bottle in the pie pan for Jigs. And after about 10 beers, Jigs would just roll over on his back, and legs would be sticking straight up the air. And this guy would carry him home because he was drunker than hell. So I, I watched all this stuff going on. And another character I remember so well was a guy named Charlie Furlong. And he was an engineer, and he would go to Brazil in Mexico and down in Central and South America and building bridges for the international highway. And he'd work for three or four months and then he'd come back to Laguna. And he had a house up on top of the world. And in those days there was only four or five houses there because there was no water up there. And one of the guys that lived up by Charlie was Dick Smith, who was the son of Pappy Smith, who owned the Coast Inn. And Dick would come down and work, <coughs> work at the Coast Inn and put a hose in a water tank in the back of his truck, fill it up all day long, and when he'd drive home at night, he, he brought all the water for the six houses were up there. And this Charlie Furlong would come back, and every time he'd come back from Mexico or Brazil or Nicaragua or somewhere, he'd bring a 
bunch of monkeys. You know, in those days there were no laws about bringing that stuff in. He'd have a parrot on his shoulder. And one time, I was so, you know, being a kid, I watched all this stuff. I couldn't believe it. He walked in the bar with a black panther on a leash. And it was a big sucker to just tie it up to the bar. And he'd be having a couple of drinks and walk home with the black panther. So Charlie Furlong was a favorite of mine because he always had some really neat animals. <clears throat> so about 1937, some of you might remember the hurricane that knocked down the pier. We had a pier, boys, by the way. And it went over, we called it pier rock then, but now it's been changed to bird rock. Uh, because we haven't had a pier for, what, 80 years or whatever it is. So the pier all got knocked down in the hurricane. All of the material, the wood, washed up on the beach, main beach. And so the older guys, like Bus McKnight and Rollo Beck and Hes McClellan and Peanuts Larson and all those guys, and there again, the city wasn't near as strict as it is today. They built a boathouse and a clubhouse with all that lumber from the pier right on the main beach where the lifeguard headquarters is now. And so that was, it, still during the Depression, you know, they, things were different. They lived in there, a bunch of them did. And um, I would hang out there because I was get, they were getting their hamburger and their beer from my old man. So I got a free ticket to come down to their clubhouse. And, you know, they're hustling chicks and having parties and having abalone, cooking abalone. And so it was neat for me to watch this. I thought, this is what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> so, so, and that's basically what I've done. So <laughs> I haven't changed much. Um, so Dick Smith, who took the water up there, got a new job from working for his dad, Pappy. Uh, and he was the first uh, motorcycle cop in Laguna. And they brought him a big Harley, and he would park it right in front of my dad's restaurant and sit at the uh, counter and drink coffee. Coffee, by the way, was five cents a cup. And uh, he'd sit there, and there was no stop signs, no stop lights, nothing in Laguna. It's a straight shot right through town. But on weekends, or busy holidays, they would roll a sign out uh, and Ocean Avenue, where my dad's restaurant was on Coast Highway, was the main intersection at that stage of the game because that's where you enter the beach. You couldn't get to the beach like you can now where all the grass is. You had to enter either up by the Hotel Laguna or on Ocean Avenue because there's restaurants and a dance hall and a bowling alley and all this other stuff there. So Dick would sit there on the wait for a guy to run down some passenger, people crossing the street, and he'd get on the motorcycle and chase them down and catch them out to the Hotel Lagoon and give them a ticket, I guess, and he'd come back. But the point was that Lucy Goosey was what Laguna was then. So here he is in a police uniform, parked the thing, and he'd get off work at 5 o'clock and go in the bar and have a couple of beers, and they used to have bets who could then uh, civilians ride the police motorcycle around the block without crashing. And they were all in there having a couple of cocktails driving around the block on the city motorcycle. So, you know, it was a lot more fun now. Now we got something to do. But, um, uh, it, was a, it was a great time to grow up. And that time, too, I was, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. And the lifeguards were always, you know, there was no money. And nobody was cognizant of having a house or a new car or any of that. It never entered your mind. It was just, where's your next meal going to come from? So people would buy a hamburger at a hamburger joint and a Coke or a Pepsi, and it was a two-cent deposit on the bottles. And they'd take them down the beach in their towel and eat the hamburger, drink their Coke. And the lifeguards figured it was a lot easier to send a little kid like me, down in front of the girls to beg for their bottles and a big lifeguard going down there. So they'd sit there with binoculars looking at the chicks having, finishing the coke. And they'd say, oh, there's two gals down there. Go down and get their bottles. So I'd go down and lay in front of them and laugh and giggle and try and get them to give me their bottles. And usually, <laughs> usually they would. And um, one time in particular, and that's what I want to tell this story, uh, a couple girls said, well, when we finish them, you can have the bottles. And so I came back, told the guys at the lifeguard tower. And the girls, after a little bit, went down to the ocean to get their feet cooled off. And they're standing in the water. And the bottles were empty. 
So they said, well, go back and get the bottles. They're down there, and they said you could have them. So I went back, and I grabbed the two bottles, and on their towel, I remember it so well, it was like two nickels and a penny or something. It was like 10, 11, 12 cents, and I scooped that up along with the bottles and took it back to the lifeguards, and I thought I was going to be a hero for giving them the extra 10 cents, and they just caved in on me and said, you stole money, you never steal anything, you've got permission for the bottles, you only take what you get permission for, and that stealing and stealing is out, and we don't prove it, you've got to take that back right now, and you can't come to the lifeguard tower for a week or something. They penalize me. But my point is that the older lifeguards, uh, like Jimmy Flynn and uh, Hems McClellan and Peanuts, as wild and crazy as they were, there was a line of right and wrong that they taught the kids. And they were like older brothers to me and told me what you could do and what you couldn't do. And a lot of things you could do by their mentality, you can't do now. So things have changed a lot. But anyway, it was a great upbringing and they were instrumental in influencing my way of, of what was right and wrong. And it, it was a great lesson. So, you know, I'm just kind of moving uh, down the line, getting older, and I remember a lot of you people think, well, Laguna's a real safe town and no gangs, and you read about Compton and L.A. and the Crips and all the gangs that we don't have. Well, let me tell you, we had gangs, and they were really on my case. So it was called the Delaney Gang. Fran Delaney uh, owned a fish market, or his dad did, and Fran was three years older than I was, and he had a, his good friend, Tessie Anderson, was kind of a tough kid. And Joe Sullivan, he had all these older guys in the Delaney gang. And they built a tree house where the Bank of America is now. It used to be a grove of eucalyptus trees. And they built a tree house there. It was really a neat tree house. And on top of that, they built a little cage. And I guess it was for me because when I come down <laughs> Park Avenue, and I didn't know the first time, they just grabbed me, tied me up, and took me down to their uh, tree house and put me in this cage on top of it. But before they put me in the cage, they pants me, and I'm up there naked in this little cage, and they're throwing little rocks in those acorns from Eucalyptus Street, and they're throwing them at me, and I'm getting little red welts all over me, and I'm walking around and trying to be missing all this stuff. Probably started crying. And they said, well, we'll let you out if you go down to your dad's restaurant and get a hamburger and some ice cream for us. So I said, okay, okay. And so they'd take me down to the restaurant. And I know uh, Rick and Donnie know Kelly Boyd, a lot of the rest of you do too real well. Well, Kelly's dad, Bob Boyd, was a cook for my dad at the restaurant at that time. Kelly wasn't even born. And I'd go down and ask Bob, can you make me a cheeseburger? And he'd say, well, for a little kid, you're eating a lot of cheeseburgers. <laughs> but I had to give them to the Delaney gang because they'd pants me again and throw rocks at me. So it was a good trade-off. I'd get a hamburger and an ice cream, and Delaney gang would leave me alone for a couple of days. So we did have gangs here. Um, <clears throat> another interesting story, I think, was in Halloween in those days, you didn't go to houses, knock on the door, and get little pieces of candy like you do now. Uh, and it was always not doing vicious things, but we would take candles and put them on the windshield of a car and put wax on the windshield so when the guy came out to get in the car, he couldn't see through the windshield. And he'd have to get out and somehow scrape all this wax off. So that was a thing that, that we did on Halloween. So we were up on Park Avenue, not very far up, just above Glen Airy, and we found an old, empty 55-gallon oil drum. And we thought, well, this will be neat if we just roll it down Park Avenue. And in those days, Park Avenue went all the way to the Coast Highway. There's no library there. And so we rolled it down there. And sure enough, it got through Glen Area, OK, and hit a car in the back bumper and dinged it a little bit. And you know they saw us, we were laughing, thought it was really funny. And the people saw us. And of course, they called the cops. And, Captain Allison, I don't know if he was chief, but he was the captain. Captain Allison, he grabbed us right away and took us down to the police station and tried to, you know, he did scare the hell out of us and signed us up like we were criminals. And they only had one cell in the jail then because most of if he really had a criminal, they'd take him to Santa Ana. 
and put them in a real jail. But we just had one cell in the police department, and they had a deal with my dad that they'd bring whoever was in jail down to the restaurant three meals a day in the back booth, and my dad's restaurant was roped off to feed whoever was in jail. And so Captain Allison called my dad and said, I got your kid in the slammer, I'm coming him down so you can sign off on him. My dad said, hell no, I said, keep him in the slammer and let the city buy his food for a change. <laughs> so I stayed in jail for a day and a half and my dad thought it was a great deal because the city bought my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> so he was making money off of me. <laughs> so it was about that time when people, you know, in those days before the war, everything was really formal. Uh, there was a guy named, I'll think of his name in a minute, uh, he drove the lumber truck and he wore <laughs> big Coke bottle glasses, but he wore a coat and tie. And ev everything was formal then. There were, everybody worked on Saturday. There was no five days a week. You worked six days. Sunday you were supposed to go to church, get a little religion, go home and have dinner with the family Sunday afternoon and rest. You go back to work on Monday. Nobody was recreating or having really any fun. It was a, it was a tough go in the Depression. So uh, that's just the way it was. And I was amazed how everybody dressed up and how formal they were. And so the war started, and after the war, I'll tell you in a minute how that changed, but the day the war started, December 7th, Sunday, I was riding my bike, I remember like it was yesterday, up Glen Airy, I was right in the intersection of Legion Street and Glen Airy, and a new church on the right would just open, a uh, scientific church, of, I forget the name of it, but uh, about noon, or as in the afternoon when I was driving by, everybody ran out of the church and said, we're at war, we're at war, and Japs bombed Pearl Harbor. And I didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was, but I rode my bike on home, and my mom told me about it, and um, what was going on. And it wasn't a day or two later that um, the army came into town, they put barbed wire on the main beach, uh, Coast Guard guys with rifles and bayonets patrolled the main beach because they really thought the Japs were going to invade, especially right at first. Now this didn't go on for years because the war got more in our favor, but at first submarines, Japanese submarines would surface and shoot at the oil wells in Huntington Beach, try and get them on fire. So the war was a real, real serious deal here in Laguna and you couldn't even go to the beach and it was blackout, the lights were out, and you had curtains, and you had gas rationing, you got two gallons a week, and the cars in those days probably only got 10 miles to the gallon, so you couldn't go far on two gallons. And the army came in with towing big artillery pieces, went to the top of the world, and put the artillery up there and had a big observation, and they could see the whole main beach and all the coastline. So a couple days later, a military officer, army officer, came to high school, and Red Geyer was the football coach and the track coach, and I was only in the, I don't know, seventh, eighth grade then, and, uh, but we had been going to relays. Coach uh, had taken us, even when we were in the fourth grade, took us to Santa Ana, uh, and we had run against all the big schools on the lawn, and we had always beat Fullerton, Long Beach, Anaheim, Santa Ana, all those big schools, and Coach would always say, well, if you guys stick together, you'll have the greatest team that Laguna's ever had, a relay team. So sure enough, the Army came up there and Coach volunteered us to be messengers for the Army. And they had radios, but they didn't work so good up on top of the world. And the headquarters for the Army was down at the police station. So the radios didn't work, as I said, so good. So they'd take our relay team and we'd run messages from the top of the world all the way to the police station. Because I lived a next, almost next to the school, I ran the last leg from the high school to the police station. And they gave us a helmet that you'll see on display back there. So I've had this army helmet that's painted white with a lightning bolt on the front because we were called messengers. And they gave us a little pouch that would carry the messages in and they'd hand it off. So the four of us, there was myself, Frank Buxton, Brayton Norton, and Petey Orser. We were the four relay team guys, and we never had to do it in real Army conditions, but we 
practice it two or three times, and that was a good experience for the war. But it was serious for us going to school. And then several times at school, they'd let us out at noon, put us in the bus, take us to Irvine. There was no town of Irvine. There was a railroad station there and the general store. There's no Mission Viejo, no freeway, no road. Nothing was back there except orange groves and lima bean fields. And we picked lima beans from noon to 3 o'clock uh, as part of the school program. And that's what you did when during the war. It was, it was uh, you know, they were short of agricultural workers. So it was, uh, it was a different world then. And so the war, after the war was over, boy, were those great times. I can't believe how good they were. I think back, those are probably the, some of the best days of my life because the guys are coming home from the service and they weren't going to work on Saturdays. They said, screw this, we want two days off. They're not wearing coat and ties. They're wearing shorts and a t-shirt. And they wanted to have some fun. They'd been at war for two or three years. And a lot of them in Laguna had left school and hadn't finished high school. So here they were back in high school with us being 25 years old, or how old they were. And so it just, the whole atmosphere, the culture, the lifestyle, the attitudes, the values, the just everything changed in your daily routine from the beginning of the war till after the war. And it was just amazing. They wanted to have fun. So boy, was that my ticket. I wanted to have fun too. So well, let's have some parties. And parties we had, and in those days, you know, we, you didn't have enough money to, the things we were doing, lifeguarding, I was tending bar, worked for Hobie Patch and surfboards, you never had any real money, but you had a dollar or something. So you could, <clears throat> we would go down, and there was a pet store in the corner, it's a bank now, in the corner of uh, Glenary and Forest, and that used to be a pet store, and there was an A&P uh, market right there too. And we'd buy horse meat for 27 cents a pound, beautiful steaks. And we'd tell the girls, we're having this big party, we're having top sirloin and lobster, and you don't want to miss it. And so, you know, in those days, you couldn't afford to take them to dinner or buy them drinks, so it was always a house party. And the girls we were hitting on were on the beach, and they were always two or three at a time. And we had a fast rule. You couldn't have just a date and bring your girlfriend. You had to bring more than one girl to the party. So we were one the odds to be in our favor. So <laughs> and all the guys had to bring three or four girls, but it was easy because they didn't want to split up. They're all laying on the beach together. They drove down from Santa Ana or Peston or wherever. So they wanted to stick together and we had to invite them for dinner. Couldn't turn down a free dinner, lobster and top sirloin. And a gallon of red wine cost a dollar and uh, so we'd feed them a little red wine and give them dinner and we'd have a party going. <laughs> I mean it was a real good party so this is where this is where the lifeguard station comes in. I watched them move that from the Union Station uh, to where it is right now uh, and I think it was 1937 they jacked it up and moved it. It was a big deal. I watched the whole thing and I actually have a picture this is what it looked like when they moved it. I don't know if you can see it very well, but it was way 10 feet higher than it is now. And it had three stories to it. And it's the city moved it. And you know, there was no organization before the war as far as life there. Not like it is now where there's captains and chiefs and they got it all structured and rules and everything. And so the life, whoever was the low, oldest lifeguard had the key to the station. And so it would be Hems or Peanuts or Bus McKnight and we'd all hang out there and we were all lifeguards. And there was no test, it was just, you're down there, Laguna guy, you're a lifeguard. So <laughs> un unbeknownst to the city, because they never came down, the city was doing politics, whatever they did. But if you can see in this picture, right here, there was really no windows. So in the ground floor, there was a ladder that went up to the second floor, and it was a, not very tall, it was only about six feet in there. And then you'd go up another little ladder to where you could look out the beach and the ocean. So in the middle layer, it was kind of dark there, so we brought some candles there. We brought a mattress up there, and you could take a nap up there, and nobody would know you're sleeping. And we had the key to the lifeguard station, so after we closed it at 5, everybody would go home, circle around the block, and come back and have a party in the second story of the lifeguard station. So 
it, this went on for years, from, from 37 until, I don't know, 46 or so. And we were having a party down there one day, and, and this city guy came down and caught us, and that's when they cut the roof down. And so now today, the lifeguards only have a two-story, and they don't have that middle park story. But we, have, we have a lot more fun than they do now. So, and speaking of lifeguards, <clears throat> this, this is Joel Baker's favorite story. But um, he's sitting back there laughing about it, because he liked that one. But uh, we're all, there used to be, going to the door of the lifeguard tower, there's about six feet from the from the boardwalk, and there was railings on there, and so we'd always sit on that railing, and our feet would be dangling, and it would be weekdays. So when I was a lifeguard, if you worked on a weekday, you didn't get paid. You only got paid on weekends or holidays, and that I think was 80 cents an hour or something. And, uh, on the weekdays, you could come down and be there because we had the key. And you know, if somebody got hurt or somebody was in the water, we'd go help them. But we really weren't on duty. We didn't get paid, so it was it was our hangout. That's where you went. I couldn't wait to get up in the morning in the summer and get to the lifeguard tower because something's going to happen today. There's enough <coughs> mischief going on down there that just being there was going to be fun. So we're sitting down there, our legs, and this was in May before Memorial Day, and we're talking about school's almost out, and I don't know what day it was. And about five or six tall, good-looking guys come down, older guys, they're all 6'2 and 6'3, and uh, they said, we want to be lifeguards in Laguna. We laughed and punching each other and, and say, well, we, we've got plenty of lifeguards. We don't, there's no applications, and we were laughing about them. They said, no, we're serious. We're from Fullerton Junior College. We just won the National Swimming Championship. And we're great swimmers, and we can swim wherever you want, and we want to be lifeguards. And I said, well, there's no chance. Uh, you know, we, we got our own guys. We got plenty of lifeguards. And about that time, a guy named Carl Mays, he's a big, lanky guy. He always reminded me of uh, Abe Lincoln. You know, he kind of had that down-home look, and he shaking his shoulders. And, and he was... He just drove the ambulance. He wasn't the city official. He wasn't anything. He was just older. And the city figured because he was older and gave a little maturity to the lifeguard. So they put him in charge. He didn't know anything about the ocean surfing waves. He never got in the water. He drove the ambulance. That's all he did. But he came down and was kind of our overseer. And so we're all sitting there that day. And here comes old Colonel May shuffling along and bobbing his head. And, and these, all these guys from Fullerton are saying, well, we want to be lifeguards. And Carl's kind of taken back, and he said, well, I don't know. What do you mean, lifeguards? Said, well, we're great swimmers, and we've been training, and we want to be guards in Laguna. And we're all laughing and snickering and sitting on this fence railing there. And Carl's looking at us, and we're laughing. And, we're, and he's kind of looking down. He doesn't look at, look at the Fullerton guys. And they kept really ragging on, well, we got to have a test. we got to have a surf stuff and swim. And, and finally, Carl said, okay, all right. He said, I got it. He said, everybody line up. Attention. Get an attention now. And so now we're looking at each other. God, he's really serious about this. And maybe he's going to do something. And so we're all standing up there and looking around, poking each other. And Fullerton guys got a big smile on their face. And, and finally, Carl says, uh, He's looking down at the ground all the time. He doesn't know what he's going to do. He's still trying to figure it out in his head. And finally he says, uh, all right, he says, everybody that started kindergarten in Laguna take one step forward. So we all take one step forward. He said, you boys are hired right now. <laughs> and, and the Fullerton guys started yelling and said, what do you mean you're hired? Don't you? you got to go swim to him. They don't know how to swim. He says, these boys have local knowledge, and that's it. And so the Florida guys went home crying and did, never did get a job, and we kept the lifeguards. And the fire department was the same way. You know, you had to be a local guy to be a fireman or a lifeguard. So that's just the way it was at Laguna in those days. It was great fun because of all that. So uh, we had a, had a good time with all the parties and lobsters and dollar gallon of wine and all that stuff. And about that... Time and years go by, and I was in college, and I was between my sophomore and um, junior year. And you know, the first couple of years of college, you teach your general stuff, and then you should come up with a major. And I came home, and it was summertime. 
we're all laying in the sand like we all stood in front of the lifeguard tower. And you know, there was all these things, there was a right way and a wrong way to do all this stuff. You, you never had a towel. I mean, a, a guy growing up in Laguna never owned a towel. You came down and you laid on the sand. You didn't lay on a towel. And you would hose off in the lifeguard tower. We'd go to the Smith Hotel and sometimes we could take a shower in there. But, it, and then I want to make this comment, it's kind of a side deal, but the wall of the, my dad's restaurant was made out of marble and, or maybe it was some other hard material and it would get really hot. And we'd be in the water from the time I was a little kid. You'd get goosebumps all over, we'd be shaking, no wetsuit, and we'd go lean against that wall, and it'd get so hot, and it would put your, put your back against it, and it felt so good, and we'd all be lined up there, eight or ten of us, and people, we didn't have cameras like everybody does now, but a few people did have them, and I remember dozens of times, people would take pictures, and look at all the cute little kids leaning against the wall, trying to stay warm, if any of you ever see a picture, I'd love to have that picture of us lined up on that wall trying to get warm. But now back to the lifeguard thing. Um, that was, was just the way it was in Laguna. And so the college came along and we're laying in the sand. And like I say, there was all these things that were established by the older guys ahead of us. But it was kind of a tradition, the way, you didn't ask about it, you just inherited the way you went to the beach, the way you carried yourself. The sand could be burning, but you'd go barefooted and you'd never run across the sand. If you ran across the sand, you were out, man. That was, that was a bad sign. You had to have, and wiggle your feet down in the sand a little cooler when it got deeper. You had to know how to do it. But you could stand there and you'd be really cold if you'd stand and let that sun, or that hot sand burn your toes. Everybody else is hopping around the beach and you'd just stand there like, you know, a big tough lifeguard and, uh, and that was the way it was. So we're laying in this circle and we'd always get in a circle, we'd smooth off the sand and that became our blackboard or our, where we'd write stuff down. And someday, you know, we're, the main topics always were surf and girls and occasionally it would be like, well, what are we going to do when we grow up? We didn't have any idea what we were going to really do. And so this was a serious day. And we're all in there, I think Peanuts Larson was there, and me, and probably Hobie, and Charlie Plummer, and I don't remember who else. And we smoothed off the sand, and I said, guys, this is serious. I've got to make a, next, in September, I go back to school, and I was older than most of them. Uh, I said, I've got to have a major, and I have no idea what I might want to be. I mean, I don't have nothing. And so, wh what, what do you think? What, what it should we be when we grow up? And so it was peanuts always came from a different angle. And peanuts said, well, wait a minute. Don't bore yourself by writing a big, long list of engineer, doctor, lawyer, things you might want to be. He said, we're going to make a list, a real short list, of things that you absolutely know you never want to do. And so we figured that's a pretty good idea, you know, that that will eliminate a lot of this stuff. And so the first thing, uh, I don't know, I think it was Charlie Plummer, one guy said, well, for sure, we don't want to ever have to wear a coat and tie to work. And so, number one on the sand, no coat or tie. And none of us had ever had a coat and tie, so that was kind of easy, but we knew that when you grew up, you know, you had to have a coat and tie. And the one guy that broke that rule, I know, is Donnie Crevier, because he had a lot of coat and ties. Uh, and he had a job, you had to wear a coat and tie. But we decided there and now on the beach that we didn't need a coat and tie. And then I said, well, you know, going to school in Laguna, I could go to high school barefooted and you didn't have to wear shoes. And the shoes you did have were flip-flops and go-aheads and maybe a pair of tennis shoes or running shoes, never a pair of hard leather shoes. So yeah, number two, no hard leather shoes. So now we're thinking real hard, what else are we sure we don't want to do? And we're thinking and thinking, and pretty soon somebody said, well, for sure we don't want to work on the inland side of the coast highway. <laughs> so we all agreed to that. And then we said, well, what does that leave? Well, we could only come up with four jobs. You could be a fisherman, a lifeguard, a bartender, or you could make surfboards. 
And Hobie said, well, I'm just going to keep making surfboards. And I was already a bartender. I'm going to keep them in bar. And to this day, most of the guys in that group never had a coat and tie or hard shoes. We did. I had the Hobie shop was on the other side, but it's only a block. <laughs> so, uh, we pretty much stuck to that. I mean, it is amazing when I look back over all these 90 some years, how we grew up and the little things that we did on the beach, that we did together, in the water, all our values and priorities come together at this older age. You look back and you think, guys, some of this stuff was crazy, but it worked out pretty good for us. So, So I did finish college, uh, and I got, uh, went into the Korean War, went to Korea, got the GI Bill, went back to graduate school, and so I, I said, well, if I'm going to graduate school, I never learned anything in college. I went there to get, uh, go surfing, I went to Santa Barbara, surf Rincon every day. There was only three surfboards in Santa Barbara at the time. So I surfed Rincon by myself or with a friend almost all the time. And, you know, there's a lot of girls up there, so that was the only reason going to college that I could see. I never got above a C on anything, except gym. And uh, so I, I you know, was going to graduate school because I had the GI Bill. It was a good way to go to Hawaii. So I moved to Hawaii for the next 30 years and started the Holy Stores and all of that. Uh, and had a good time surfing. And, and I came back here because I had read in a bunch of magazines uh, about, I wanted to do other things. You know, we weren't going to wear coat and tie and shoes. And I'd always read about Australia and other places I wanted to go see. So I came up with five things that I wanted to do. I had no idea how I was going to do any of them. But I wanted to go to Tahiti in the South Sea and see naked girls. And that was a tie on my ass. <laughs> well, I mean, you don't realize it. Now you can go to the main beach in Laguna and see naked girls. <laughs> In my day growing up, you know, they had almost Mother Hubbard bathing suits on it. No skin. So I wanted to go to the South Sea and see topless girls. I wanted to go to Australia because I knew it's a continent. There had to be surf on that big island somewhere. I wanted to go to Africa and see wild animals and wild tribes. I wanted to go to the Olympic Games in Rome in 1960. And I wanted to run with the bulls in Pamplona, Spain. <clears throat> And I did all five of those things, or four of those things, whatever it was. And I didn't know how I was going to get to any of them. But I hitchhiked from Laguna. I started hitchhiking in front of the Sandpiper, uh, where I'd been tending bar, uh, to Panama. And I got a ride on a ship. And this is a whole other story. I'm not going to bore you with this. I don't know what our time schedule is. Five more minutes, and we'll open up to questions. OK. Uh, I know we're on the clock here with this. Uh, so anyway, I hitchhiked around the world. I got jobs on ships. I didn't fly anywhere. Hitchhiked across all the continents. Uh, it took me three years. Um, I got to Africa, spent a year and a half in Africa. Was the first person to surf in Africa. This was before surf movies, surf magazines. You know, there's none of surf commercial stuff. And when I came home, um, three years later, I showed Hobie and Bruce and all my best friends where I'd surfed all over the world. And I got Bruce to follow my trip. He did it five years later uh, and made the famous movie, The Endless Summer. <clears throat> so um, <laughs> then I went on, lived in Hawaii, surfed and skied, and uh, started Surfing Heritage and the biggest surf museum in the world. Well, you put all the other surf museums together, barring Australia, maybe, I don't know how big they are. But uh, if you put those together, we're bigger in square footage and materials than all the rest of the museums put together. So I invite you all to do that. I did that once before, but I'm inviting you again. So anyway, I started that in 1999. It's going strong. And a year and a half ago, some uh, Hollywood producer heard about the Bruce Brown Endless Summer kind of story and called me and took me back to South Africa and made a new movie called The Birth of the Endless Summer. And it's how I discovered these surf spots and got Bruce to make The Endless Summer. And that'll be shown on Netflix or 
uh, Amazon this May and June. It will be in movie theaters, too. So, so uh, there's other stories there, but I won't bore you with those. So if there's any question and answer, came from the colleges and there was just so many girls and guys and people hitchhiking every place and you know we worked at the hamburger stands down there the blue wave <laughs> well it was a different world then and people thought different think different values were different you know you can in a lot of ways it seemed like there was a lot more freedoms of doing whatever you wanted to do how you wanted to do it when you wanted to do it uh, you know, I, I, can, I think you could still do the hitchhiking around the world that I did. I mean, it was, I was in Kenya when the Mau Mau were upraising and they're, they're killing all the whites and, uh, you know, there's wars going on everywhere. But, uh, you know, it's how, at least I think, it's how you handle yourself in those situations. And I think in Africa, I look back and say, well, I didn't get in as much trouble as I certainly could have. But there was war. I was I was in the Belgian Congo when they beheaded Lumumba. I saw that from a hotel rooftop, and they took over the town and firebombed the hotel and uh, machine gunning everybody. I don't know you might remember they killed a bunch of nuns in the Belgian Congo and flew in the Belgian paratroopers, and I was there for witnessing that whole thing and hiding under a table in the hotel, and they're throwing Molotov cocktails, but. Um, the difference, and I look back, the white guys, all those colonies in, in England then, uh, are all the countries, were colonies of Germany, Belgium, France, England, somebody, and whether you're a Frenchman or an Englishman, they all dressed the same. They had white buck shoes, white stockings on, white shorts, a white little blouse, and a pith helmet. And to all the black people that lived in Africa, that's what a white man kind of represented. But when I got to Africa, I had been walking and hitchhiking for two years by the time I got there. I had hair down to my shoulders, a beard. I had a funny Tahitian hat on with a bunch of beads on it. I had a pair of shorts on, <coughs> or torn. The, <coughs> the biggest thing I had that was similar, I had a sandals made out of tires. And they all had sandals made out of tires. And they had pound their hand together, point at their feet and my feet, and go, hunga bunga boo, uh, you're kind of one of us. They weren't sure if I was what I was, but I didn't <laughs> either side. So I think that helped me skate through a lot of uh, otherwise serious problems. Yeah, Dick, so what, what kind of, two questions. What kind of surfboard were you dragging around pre-endless summer? And out of all these experiences, I'm just wondering, do you have any regrets? No regrets at all. But, you know, I, I, it makes it sound, when you get home and you tell about it, it sounds like a lot more fun than it was. Uh, I, I mean, it, it was hard. You know, it was drudgery a lot of times. You're by yourself. You're lonely. Uh, I waited in Africa 17 days for the first car to come by. I'm not, it's not like one-on-one, they're zipping by, you got your thumb out. You didn't stand by the road. We're talking about a dirt track, a four-wheel drive truck that has to carry at least 100 gallons of gas in the back to get them to the next. There's no gas station. There's no food stores. There's nothing. So it's, I sat there for 17 days in a little black village eating the peanut butter. There's peanut grown all over Africa, so I always had jars of peanut butter and loaves of French bread, and I ate peanut butter sandwiches three meals a day. Uh, and so it sounds fun when you're here telling a story, but for 17 days, uh, crossing the Sahara Desert, eating peanut butter, try that. <laughs>
Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't answer that question. Actually, I didn't take a surfboard. It was too hard to lug a surfboard around and, and hitchhike. So I knew, see, the, the year before I, I got to Australia in 1958. In 1957, a bunch of guys from Hawaii went and to Sydney and had a surf contest and they left their boards there. So I knew that in Australia there were surfboards. So I didn't bother about that. In Africa, I didn't know no surfboards, but what there was at, at J Bay, which is the famous, world famous surf spot that, that I found, it's called Cape St. Francis. It's a huge big bay, it's got a lot of different breaks to it. Uh, it's probably the best surf in the world consistently. It breaks every day like clockwork there. But uh, somebody had left an Australian ski there. And an Australian ski is kind of like a, a paddle board with a kick nose on it. And it's not a surfboard, but you surf on it. And so I, I used that in Africa. And then I made surfboards wherever I could, but the, they didn't have the materials most of the place. You know, balsa wood was what we were using. Foam hadn't come out by the time I left in 58. Foam wasn't available until 1961. And um, so balsa wood is only grown in Bolivia, and you don't go to a lumber yard in Africa and buy balsa wood. So, uh, you know, there's no fiberglass or resin, so it was hard to make them. But in, I was okay in South Africa, because uh, no, I did make boards there. Uh, in the movie, if you'll remember, uh, The Endless Summer, I set Bruce up with, uh, who became like my best friend, John Whitmore. He had a little white goatee, if you remember the movie. And he was a used car salesman when I met him on the beach. And he'd never seen a surfboard. There's no magazines. But he had a calendar. I, I hope I'm not using too much time here, but I get fired up on all these stories. So, uh, in 1937, he had a Pan Am calendar, and Pan Am, on each month, would have a picture of where they flew. Singapore, Hong Kong, Honolulu, and he had this picture of Waikiki uh, taken from the top of the Moana Hotel, it showed Waikiki, a surfboard leaning against the seawall, and a couple of guys standing up on a surfboard, but they were tiny, tiny. And he made a surfboard out of that picture, out of the calendar. And so he was a used car salesman. He had three daughters, and he was, you know, almost starving to death. And I came along and changed his whole life. And I came, I've been there 14 times. So the first time on this trip we're talking about, when I finally came home a year later, I filled up a container of, of foam, by then we had foam blanks and uh, resin and fiberglass and all the materials, shipped it to him and then I flew to Cape Town and showed him how to make surfboards. And he quit uh, making, uh, selling cars and the next time he had a little, little, he called it a cottage on the beach, little tiny two bedroom, 800 square feet house. And when I came back the second time, or the third time after he'd made surfboards, we gave him the distributorship for all of Africa to make Hobie surfboards, Hobie catamarans. And he had the highest house on Table Mountain, spectacular house. I mean, he was a smart guy. I just opened the door for him, but it changed his whole life. I mean, just radically changed. Well, so many guys in South Africa, done, they got in the industry and started, I made him the Maury Boogie distributor, Surfer Magazine distributor, got him all these jobs and he made them work. You know, he was a great guy. And there's a, a wor world of stories I could tell you about all the time in Africa with him and all the many trips. I've taken my mom there twice, took my wife there twice, and I've been there a total of 14 times. So. That back and forth, I stay in communication all the time with John Whitmore died, uh, but his kids who were four and five years old the first time I met them are now 65. I stayed with them on the last trip. They're grandmothers, and I saw all them and stayed there, so it was a great time. Well, I wasn't in the endless summer, but they followed my trip in making the endless summer. So, you know, the most uh, fun part to me in the endless summer was when I got Bruce Brown to meet John Whitmore, 
and John took him around South Africa and then took him to J Bay that I had surfed and been there three times before Bruce ever got there, five years before he got there. So I laugh at that because Bruce made it seem like he discovered it. But, <laughs> and that was fine, we're good friends, you know, there was no animosity or anything, it was just fun the way he did it. So that was my favorite part. Got they, right got bring, they got the mic up there. So right, up, right back here, we've got a question. Uh, wh whatever happened to Heads McClelland, Larry Johnson often referred to him with affection. And I wonder whatever happened to Heads. Well, he passed away years ago. <clears throat> uh, he was got diabetes. <clears throat> Excuse me. He lost a foot and lost a leg on the other side from diabetes. Was in a wheelchair, but we had a great a service for him off the main beach here. The fire truck came from the fire department with uh, hoses going off on the main beach and boats and all of us were out in the water uh, for Hez McClellan, a great guy and a great friend. She's Carolyn Burris. Hold on. I just wanted to thank you Dick uh, for being here and thank you for I called Dick a few years back. He invited me to his museum so that I could interview him about my dad. So I want to thank you to continue to honor Dick Smith. Thank you. We run up to the front. Hold on. I'll come back. All the all the surfers that you've seen and surfed with, Hebs, Peanuts, Obi, and so many more, was there one that stood out that was your favorite or that really just blew, <laughs> blew you away? Well, that's that's a tough question because uh, you know the best surfers in the world have been friends of mine for the last fifty years, and surfing has changed so much. When Peanuts and I and Hebs were surfing on a redwood board with no fin, weighed 109 pounds. Uh, it really wasn't surfing what they do today. Uh, you know, now they're on a five pound uh, foam board that's only six feet long and it's so maneuverable. It's just a different sport almost because there's, there it really is. There's long boarding and short boarding. And so certainly the heyday, Phil Edwards had a great style and he lives in Dana Point, a real good friend. Um, you know, just so many guys. I lived in Hawaii for 30 years and surfed with Buzzy Trent and Buffalo and all the Hawaiian guys. Rabbit Kai Cow is a real good friend of mine. And they were all really good watermen. I mean, it's, they understood the water, the currents, the tides, and could read the waves. But they were good athletes as well. And I don't know that, you know, in your home break, you, you can be better than you are in another break. And so you'd see Buzzy surfing a Makaha, but he couldn't surf as well at Queens as Rabbit could, you know. So hard to pick one guy, but there's many guys that are really great surfers that I've been friends with all my life. I can't, can't believe a guy like Peanuts surfing the biggest wave at Killer Dana right. without, a, without a fan. Yeah, no fan. How is that well, he just locked in. He went off on an angle to begin with. He's pad not paddling straight off. Now they paddle straight off, do a bottom turn, and accelerate out of that. But you had to paddle into the curl and stick that rail in the side of the wave and hope that it holds. But most of the time, if it was a steep wave, it would just slide down the wave. But Dana Point was big water, but it wasn't really steep. And you could hold the rail, and the rail is not that thick. Uh, nowadays, you know, it's this thick. Uh, could hold it in there. So Peanuts was a gutsy guy. Hems actually saved him one day out at, at the trestle on a big set. Peanuts always would go out further than anybody else. He might only get one or two waves all day, but it was usually the biggest one. And uh, he got crashed in this uh, shore break and uh, was floundering around the white water, and Hebs was on the beach, I was there with him, Hebs swam out and pulled peanuts in, so. <laughs> Those guys played an instrumental role. Excuse me, wait a minute. Those guys played an instrumental role in saving uh, access to Salt Creek, public access. Yeah, so. Somebody in the back had asked, just What years did you and Hebs have the speak of liquor? 
Well, actually, Rick Balsa made it remember better than I did. That's a story in itself. Hills and I literally grew up together. He was like a big brother to me. And he worked at Gill's Liquor on Broadway. And my dad had a liquor store in Huntington Beach that I totally screwed up and it went broke. Uh, but I saved it the last minute by selling the liquor license to Disneyland in 1956. And it paid all the bills, and that's when I left to go around the world. But Hems and I always kind of dreamed of having a liquor store uh, on our own. We didn't have to dress up. It could be on the ocean side. fit all our categories. And so, but we never had enough money to ever have a liquor store. So it was, it was our dream, but it, I, we didn't think it would ever happen. So when I moved to Hawaii, I opened all the Hobie stores, and there were no surf attire, uh, surf clothes or trunks, then hang tan wasn't around, no, there were just no, you could buy a pair of, uh, they call them pool sets, where the trunks and the, they have a little blouse, you'd go to Palm Springs and sit around the pool, well surfers weren't wearing that crap, so, uh, you know, I surfed in torn off Levi's for years and years, so I started a company in Hawaii called Surfline Hawaii, and you might remember it as jams, which were long, shorts, bright Hawaiian Perry U prints. So I started that in 1964, and I, my partner was Dave Rockland, and he was way more creative than I was and was good at designing stuff. And I decided to sell it to him. Well, he couldn't buy it, so Jimmy Fluger, who was a car distributor ship in Hawaii, had some money, and he bought half of Surfline for me for $50,000. And <clears throat> I had the 50 grand in the bank. I'd only had it about a week sitting in there. And I'm thinking, what, what am I going to do? That 50 grand, you could retire on that. And um, so Hems calls me. He said, I was just talking to Jules Marine, who a bunch of you must know. He owned the White House Cafe and uh, the Spigot Liquor Store. And Jules was a good friend of Hems and mine. And, Jules knew my dad real well, and he finally told Hems one day, I'll sell you the Spigot Liquor Store for 50 grand. And, and so Hems called me, he said, can you, we, I can, we can buy the Spigot for 50 grand, how much you got? Said, well, this was before I had the 50 grand. And I said, well, I got like 700 bucks or something. And he said, well, I'm on the same. I said, well, I don't know how we're gonna raise it. And then I sold it. And I took $50,000 and put it in a Christmas card, it was right before Christmas, and sent it to Hebs. Now you that know Hebs know how he overreacts everything he ever did. So I wasn't there, of course, because I mailed it to him, but I, it was an elaborate Christmas card. He opened it up with $50,000 in it, and they say he ripped off his shirt, he fell on the floor, he did it rolled around, and he's giggling, and there was people in the store trying to buy stuff, and he's tearing off his clothes and screaming and yelling. That was his normal manner. Uh, under, under dire circumstances, he was so happy about it. I said, there's the 50 grand, buy the spigot. So we bought it, I owned it, and Hev's worked it, and I later sold part of it to him. I have a quick question for you, Dick. Uh, you mentioned the pier at Bird Rock or uh, Pier Rock there. Where was the pier in relation to well, that rock? Well, the pier went right across Bird Rock. So, it, right, you know, where the lookout is now, there were stairs and, and you could kind of go down the cliff, and the pier was built up. And you'd enter the pier right below the lookout, uh, but it went. It was built right across. That's why they called it Pier Rock. And it went, of course, further out than that. And when I was a kid in the early '30s, um, after my uncle got uh, slot machines outlawed and gambling in Laguna, there were ships that would be two miles off the coast, which was outside the county limits, and those could be gambling ships. And you could, they had little boats that would come from the ships to the Laguna Pier and take you out two miles out to gamble for the day and then bring you back. So the pier was not only used for fishing, but it was used to go to the gambling boats. Were, were there any other structures along the coast here that are now gone that you remember? No, the, there, you know, it was a rickety pier when I remember it. And actually it was condemned before the hurricane took it down. And they put signs across the entrance 
and a couple of boards were missing, but as kids would climb over that and run out on the pier and have to jump over and look down to the water and the rocks below. So it was always a little rickety, and that's why they never rebuilt it. It wasn't a good place for a pier. And the pier that they put in Aliso really kind of took the place of that in a way, but of course there was no gambling off of that either. Any other questions? Well, thank you. I appreciate all of you coming.